of them when you wonder what your role is in this country and what your future is in it. How precisely you're going to reconcile yourself to your situation here and how you're going to communicate to the vast, heedless, unthinking, cruel, white majority that you are here. I mean, I remember the first time I saw James Baldwin, you know, on the David Susskind show when I was a kid. I never heard anyone talk like that. You know, I always said I'm the only Jew in America whose first exposure to intellectual, it was a black guy. You know, I mean, I didn't know there was such a thing as Jewish intellectuals. I did not grow up among them. So my idea of an intellectual was James Baldwin. I never heard anyone talk like that in my life. I was, like, completely mesmerized by him. When I was growing up, I was taught in American history books that Africa had no history, and neither did I. That I was a savage about whom the less said the better, who had been saved by Europe and brought to America. And of course, I believed it. I didn't have much choice. Those were the only books there were. Everyone else seemed to agree. If you walk out of Harlem, ride out of Harlem, downtown, the world agrees. What you see is much bigger, cleaner, whiter, richer, safer. And it would seem then, of course, that it's an act of God, that this is true, that you belong where white people have put you. It seems to me that of all the indictments Mr. Baldwin has made of America, here tonight and in his copious literature of protest, the fire next time, uh, in which he threatens America. Uh, he didn't, in writing that book, speak with the British accents that he used exclusively tonight, uh, in which he threatened America with the necessity uh, for us to uh, jettison, uh, for us to jettison our entire civilization the only thing that the white man has that the Negro should want, he said, is power. You wrote a fantastic piece in Vanity Fair on race. And I just really want to know how you felt about the public discourse about race in this last election. You know, I mean, Obama's speech about race I thought was great. I thought, I thought that... I mean, it seemed astonishing to me that no one made such a speech before. Yeah, I mean, here's the problem with being ahead of your time. By the time everyone gets around to it, you're bored. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, um, I, think that, uh, I think that people are afraid to talk about it um, because they feel they don't want to offend people or their usual way of talking about it is, in fact, offensive, and they're trying to think what would be the non-offensive way to talk about it. <laughs> um, I think that that's probably true a great deal of the time. You know, I think it's very important that there be a black president, mostly so that we got it over with. So that, you know, this, this is something that should be, should be in our past. This shouldn't be our present. This is absurd. It's an absurd way to categorize people. It is, I mean, in that piece that you talked about, um, uh, uh, Errol, my editor, interviewed me about that. He asked yes. me, did I think racism would end? Uh -huh. You know, could it end? And I said, no, I didn't think it would end. You know, but I think it could end. It's possible for it to end because it's a fantasy. Fantasy. Racism is a fantasy of superiority. A fantasy can end. You know, it probably won't, but it can. Whereas, you know, um, uh, inequality of women would never end because it's biological. It's a reality. You know, men are really different from women. There is really a difference between men and women. There is not really a difference between pe people of different races. You know, not, I mean, the difference is skin deep, mm -hmm. you know, and so that racism can end. I don't think it will end. I don't think the election of Barack Obama shows that it ended. I just think it showed that it's not as bad as it was, mm -hmm. you know, which is really the most we can hope mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. I think that we're astonished that the Americans did anything good. <laughs>